الحمد لله رب العالمين العاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على ظالمين اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام والسنة All praise and thanks belong to Allah for guiding us to Islam and for guiding us to the Sunnah. Ya marhaban bikum. We welcome you again to another episode of From Darkness to Light, The Journey into Islam. In today's episode, bithnilahi ta'ala, we want to continue with a series that we had started some time ago within this series. And that is going over the small yet tremendous book, a concise manual for the new Muslim by the Fadil to Shaykh Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Burai Hafidahullahu Ta'ala. In the previous sessions, we have covered the introduction, the first chapter, which is the favor of Islam, and we have covered the second chapter, which is the manner of entering into Islam. In today's session, we want to look at the next chapter, which is the obligation of establishing Tawheed. Now, Tawheed, this is the Arabic term which is translated as true Islamic monotheism. This concept, this means that we establish worship to Allah and to Allah alone. And all of those things that are connected to worship, all of those things that constitute worship and every type and every category of worship, it belongs to Allah and to Allah alone. And this is what we testified to in the Shahada when we said, when we articulated, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah where we testified that nothing has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. So this means that all forms of worship belong to Allah and to Allah alone. And this is the purpose and the reason that we were created. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He informs us in the Quran in His statement where He said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I did not create the jinn nor the mankind except for them to establish my worship or except for them to worship me. So we have to establish the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way that worship could be established is by worshiping Allah and Allah alone. Because anything shy of this, then it will not constitute worship it will not be considered worship and it will not be worship so if a person were to pray for example to allah and to something else then in reality this will not constitute as being prayer it will not count as being prayer why because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not accept that others are worshiped alongside with him or in his stead. But all worship must be for Allah and for Allah alone. And if there's anything, any act of devotion that is given to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is not accepted and it is not worship in reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran addressing our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah ta'ala, he says, وَلَقَدَ وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَّا الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ And verily, we have, what translated means, and verily, we have revealed unto you, O Muhammad, just like we revealed to those who came before you, that if you were to associate partners with me in worship, then verily, those actions, those deeds, then they will be rendered null and void. Your deeds, 
more correct translation, will be rendered null and void, meaning that what? They will not count. Why? Because partners would have been associated with Allah in worship. So it is important that we understand this reality and that we strive to live our lives to make sure that we are worshiping Allah and Allah alone. And this was the call of every prophet and of every messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent every prophet and every messenger with the call, calling their people to establish the worship to Allah and to Allah alone. Allah ta'ala, he says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُضُ اللَّهَ وَاشْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Allah Ta'ala, He says what means, and verily we have sent to every nation a messenger proclaiming, worship Allah alone and stay away from the false deities, stay away from the false gods, stay away from that which is worship other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the Shaykh, he mentions, and we're just going to read the translation, bi'ithnillahi Ta'ala. The Shaykh, he mentions, after... Mentioning the chapter heading of this particular chapter, which is, again, the obligation of establishing Tawheed, true Islamic monotheism. The Shaykh, he mentions, he says, after articulating the Shahada, it is then incumbent upon you to establish Tawheed. And again, Tawheed, it means true Islamic monotheism. This means that we worship Allah, we worship Allah alone. That we have to establish a tawheed, the true Islamic monotheism. He said, We must establish it. It is incumbent upon you to establish tawheed in yourself so that there does not emanate from you that which will ruin and, dim and, and diminish your tawheed. This is very important because we could ruin and nullify our expression of tawheed. And that is by what? By worshipping other than Allah. By making dua, supplication to other than Allah. By praying to other than Allah. By being scared of others in situations where we should only be scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, if an individual is scared and has what is called the secret fear, meaning that an individual is scared of being harmed in a situation where only Allah could harm him. So for example, a person is scared that if they violate one of Allah's commandments, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will punish them, for example, to have this level of fear for other than Allah will be polytheism. To be scared that one's wife will not get pregnant due to a lack of devotion to other than Allah, then this will be polytheism. To be scared that one or that harm will befall an individual due to their lack of devotion or quote-unquote disrespect to a idol or to a rock, a stone, or even a human being. To fear that now that human being is going to make you sick by giving you this or that from the ailments, then this is polytheism. Why? Because no one can cause harm. No one can bring unto you harm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not decree for you. Just like no one can give you any benefit that Allah ta'ala did not decree for you. If Allah did not give it to you, no one can give it to you. And if Allah gave it to you, no one can take it from you. It is all by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to fear these things, like an individual would fear Allah, then this is polytheism. I'll give you another example. We have mentioned this before in other settings, in other classes and episodes. The story of the individual who was begging outside of the masjid of Sayyid Bedoui in Egypt. When they were asking for the money, one of the individuals who was with Sheikh Saleh Abd Aziz Ali Sheikh, Hamidullah Ta'ala, he had given the individual some money. 
because they were asking for the money. But then when they thanked Sayyid Bedawi, he told the person, give me the money back. I did not give you money so that you may associate partners with Allah and worship. So he took his money back. He said, give me back the money. The cab driver, he, he saw what had transpired. He saw this exchange and what had transpired and he heard what was said. The cab driver, because he had some corruption inside of his beliefs, he was from those who was of the wrong belief, believing that Sayyid Bedawi, a person who was dead, could harm him and, and could harm other people. So when he saw this, and he saw this exchange, he felt that this was something that was disrespectful to Sayyid Bedawi. And now Sayyid Bedawi was potentially going to get them and to do something harmful unto them. So the cab driver was very nervous while they were driving. And he made it clear the source of his anxiety and why he was nervous because of the manner in which the money was taken back and why it was taken back. So this type of fear of a person who was dead, a person who even when they were alive, right, could not bring upon them the harm in which he thought that will be brought upon them, then this is a form of polytheism as it relates to fear. Now, this is a form of polytheism as it relates to fear. In any event, once they got to their destination, they got there safe and sound, nothing happened. The Shaykh, Hafizullah Ta'ala, Shaykh Saleh, Abd Aziz Ali Shaykh, he had mentioned to the person, all of these things in which you were scared of, that Sayyid Bedi was going to do, so on and so forth, obviously he was incapable of doing it. This is the meaning of what he conveyed unto the person, that basically you were scared for no reason. You were scared for no reason. Why? Because firstly, nothing happened. Secondly, the one that you feared can harm us, could not harm us to begin with. So in, in essence, you were scared for no reason. Your, your fear was misplaced. In any event, these are just some examples, some practical examples that it is not committing acts of polytheism. They're not restricted to just bowing down or prostrating to other than Allah. It is not restricted by just praying in the name of something other than Allah, but rather they could take many forms like what was aforementioned, being scared of something, having that secret fear of something and being scared of that thing like you are scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is what? This is the secret fear. Now, just for FYI, when it comes to natural fear, then there's nothing wrong to have natural fear. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand. If there is a gigantic dog in front of you and you know because the dog is not upon a leash, the dog is within striking distance and you are scared of that dog, then that's fine because that's a natural fear. Because that dog can reach out and, he, and that dog can bite you. Nah, so you're scared of that dog because that dog can actually bite you. He is, you can feel his breath and maybe feel the saliva coming off of his ravenous uh, yani, tongue as he's barking at you, yani, you know, very aggressively and violently. So to be scared in that situation, this is fine. This is a natural fear. This is not polytheism. But to be scared of something that is dead, for example, that does not have the ability to bring to you the harm that you are in fear of, or who was not present, being that they're not physically present, or being that they are dead. They're dead. They can't do anything to you. So why would you be scared of a person in this regard? Right? And, 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 and so on and so forth. And there are detailed classes that speak about each of these things, which I encourage, I encourage myself, and I encourage every Muslim to study these things because these things have to be studied. Now, in order to establish the Tawheed, as the Shaykh is mentioning, and in order to stay away from those things that will diminish our Tawheed, our application, our devotion to Allah by true monotheism, in order to do that, then we have to study. We have to study so that we know exactly what to do and how to do it, and we know exactly what to stay away from and how to stay away from it, and why we should stay away from it, so on and so forth. So this is very, very, very important. So the Shaykh, he brings some examples here, uh, going back to the, uh, the book. 
the Sheikh, he brings some examples. He says, Thus, beware of calling upon and supplicating to others than Allah, or to others with Allah. So beware of supplicating to others along with Allah. No matter whether it be an angel, a prophet, or a righteous man, living or deceased. For example, don't say, O Messenger of Allah. So for example, do not call upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because no matter how great an individual is and there is no human being that is greater than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no one more righteous than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no jinn better than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the best of Allah's creation, period. But even with his high status, even with his superiority that is unquestioned and undoubted, even with this, he doesn't deserve anything from worship. Why? Because all worship belongs to Allah and to Allah alone. So, if it is an angel like Jibreel, and Jibreel is the best angel, he does not deserve worship. If it is a prophet like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is the best prophet, he does not deserve worship. All worship only belongs to Allah. And this is what we testified to. When we said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, that I testify and bear witness that nothing has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. So if this is the case with the best angel and the best prophet, so now what about those who are less in status? What about those who are less in virtue than the afford to that were mentioned? Now, then of course they don't deserve anything from worship. So I don't care how righteous a scholar is. I don't care how righteous an imam is. I don't care how righteous a personality is. I don't care what they have done from outstanding things. They do not deserve worship. And to worship them is to diminish or to destroy your tawheed. It's to destroy your devotion of worshiping Allah and Allah alone. It will destroy your implementation of true Islamic monotheism. And this is a very important thing. So I don't care if the person is alive. We don't pray to anybody that's alive. We don't supplicate to anyone that's alive. We don't prostrate and, 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 and worship anyone who is alive. So if we don't worship and supplicate to someone alive, what sense would it make to go to a grave and to commit acts of quote unquote worship or yeah to a grave? It'll make no sense. Go to a grave, a person that's dead, and you asking him for something? If you were to ask him for a glass of water, he can't pass you even a glass of water because he's dead. If a person was dead laying on the table and there was a pitcher of water and an empty glass and you ask that person, hey, could you pour me a glass of water? He can't even pour you the glass of water. Why? Because he's dead. So now what sense would it make to go to his grave and to ask him to allow your wife to get pregnant, to yeah, help you pass a test, to cure so-and-so from such and such sickness. It, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It, it, it defies ration. It, it makes no sense. All right. And worse than that, because you can do something stupid that's not polytheism. But what's even worse than that is that it's polytheism at, on top of everything. That, I mean, that, that's what makes it even worse. That is polytheism. So, of course, we have to be very diligent in learning about our religion so that we may do what is right. So we cannot call upon anyone, righteous man, angel, prophet, living or deceit. We cannot call upon them. So, for example, don't say, O Messenger of Allah. Don't say, O Hussein. Don't say, O Ali. Don't say, O Fatima. Don't say, O Bedawi. Or other than them from created things, whether living or deceased. Rather, call upon and supplicate to Allah alone without associating partners with Him. This is a very important point the Shaykh is mentioning, and I really want to stress and highlight this point 
Because unfortunately, you have many, even those who call themselves Muslims, who they will call upon others along with Allah or instead of Allah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. And we ask Allah to save us from the likes of these things. Also, the Shaykh, he brought examples that the listener may be familiar with. But there may be some other examples that people here in the West are also familiar with, but may not necessarily come to mind when having this discussion. From that will be that which will enter into a person who will call upon their mother or call upon their father. Naam, and I'm talking about if they're alive. A person is all the way in Michigan, for example, and their parent is all the way in Minnesota, right? So maybe a person say, I don't, I don't know where those places are. All right, no problem. A person is all the way on the East Coast and their parent is on the West Coast. I'm not talking about they're on the phone and they're FaceTiming them and what, no, no, I'm not talking about that. Wire me some money, whatever, you know, something they can do. No, no. They're all the way on the East, their parent is on the West Coast and then something happens. They, you know, almost get hit by a car or something and they're calling out, oh, mommy. Oh, daddy, mama saved me. Daddy said, this is polytheism as well. This is polytheism. Why? Because you're calling upon your parent and your parent can't save you. The parent doesn't even know what's going on right now. They're all the way across the other side of the country. What are they going to do for you? They don't even know that you're in peril right now. So this also is polytheism and something else. But we'll come to inshallah ta'ala and we'll come back to the parents. In any event, the sheikh, he goes on to say, Likewise, do, don't slaughter for other than Allah. So when we slaughter our animals, it is not permissible to slaughter animals in the name of something else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we slaughter our animals in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh, he says, and don't swear by other than Allah. And don't, and we're going to come back to this point about swearing. And the Shaykh, he says, and don't seek refuge. In your affairs, except with Allah, who in his hands lies everything. The Most High said, addressing his Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Ta'ala, he said, addressing the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُلْ لَا أَمْلِكُ Say unto them, O Muhammad, O Muhammad, you say unto them, لَا أَمْلِكُ لِنَفْسِي نَفَعَ وَلَا ضَرَرَ Allah. Allah commanded the Prophet Muhammad to draw this point home and to highlight and to stress this point for those who may have and fall into a misconception. And say, O Muhammad, say to them, I possess no power of benefit or hurt for myself except as Allah wills. So the Prophet is telling us, I cannot benefit myself nor could I even hurt myself except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if this is the case, then definitely I cannot help you nor hurt you except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if this is the case as it relates to the best of mankind, the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then undoubtedly this is the case as it relates to less than him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Shaykh he goes on to say, consequently, if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not possess any power to benefit or harm himself when he was alive, then logically, and more so, he doesn't possess any power to benefit or harm others after his death. Ma'am, and again, if this is the case for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then undoubtedly this is the case for others, other than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Shaykh he goes on, and he says, if this is the case for the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who is the best human being ever, then other than him, even more so, does not possess the power to harm or to benefit or harm. So beware and do not swear by others than Allah. Do beware and not swear by other than Allah. For verily the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man kana halifan falyahlif billah. 
awliyaf smut. That whoever is going to swear, whoever is going to make an oath, right? Whoever is going to make an oath, they're going to swear. Then swear by Allah or be quiet. If you're going to make an oath, then swear by Allah or be quiet. Naam. This is the point I wanted to come back to as it relates to our parents. And in particular, our mothers. Individuals, they will swear by their mothers. Naam. Or they will swear on the grave of their parents. Or they will swear on the grave of their yeah, any grandparents. Or they will say, on my children, so on and so forth. Which is to swear by them. They will say, on such and such, so on and so forth. Which is to swear by that thing. And what is an indication, especially in today's lingo and jargon, which is an indication that this is an act of swearing, is that they have a construction that is isolated and dedicated to God. So they will say, on God, so on and so forth. But then in the next breath, they may say, on my parents, so on and so forth. Or they will say, on so and so in them, so on and so forth. وَعِيَاذُ billah. All of this is what is polytheism because we are only to swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that is other than by Allah, on Allah, this is the truth. On Allah, I did not lie. On Allah, this really happened. To say anything else and swear by anything other than Allah, then this is polytheism. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, so whoever is going to swear, then let them swear by Allah or be quiet. Naam. So as Muslims, what is more familiar is that we will say, Wallahi, by Allah, so on and so forth. Billahi, by Allah, so on and so forth. Tallahi, so on and so forth. By Allah, so on and so forth. Naam. This is how the Muslims, how we swear. right? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't swear by Muhammad. We don't swear by Jesus. We don't swear by the angels. We don't swear by the rocks. So of course, we're not going to swear by anything. We're only going to swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not going to say on my mother. We're not going to say on my mother's grave, on my grandma's grave, on my grandfather's grave, on, on, on. We're not going to swear by our children, on my seeds, so on and so forth. As people, they say, no. We only swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So either swear by Allah or be quiet. And the reason I bring this up is because people, they have become so acclimated to swearing by other than Allah, that it slips out. It slips out. Naam. So the ulama, they mention that if you were to be in this situation, as new Muslims, perhaps you may find yourself in a situation, you will so acclimate to saying on such and such, that you may say that. Naam. If that were to happen, you would have fallen to slip into that, then what's the best way to expiate that? The scholars, they mention is to bring the statement of it to Heed, once you have realized what you have said, and this is wrong, this is not correct, then you bring the statement of it to Heed and you say, La ilaha illallah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And you, and, you, and, and you ask Allah to forgive you. You seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the likes of these slips of, of, of the tongue. And you should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help rectify you and to rectify your tongue. But in any event, if you slip up and you say one of these things that you shouldn't be saying, then you turn around immediately and you say, La ilaha illallah. Naam. In any event, these are just some examples the Shaykh he brings to show us that we really have to strive to implement the Tawheed after accepting Islam, after making our Shahada, Naam. after taking our Shahada, that we strive to live up to it, we strive to implement it, we strive to live our lives in accordance to it, so we worship Allah and Allah alone. All acts of worship belong to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and we follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we don't put anyone's speech in front of that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't follow anyone, yani, instead of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't look for any type of guidance outside of that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brought to us, that which he conveyed to us, that which he taught us, that we don't put any scholar, we don't put any imam, we don't put anyone 
in front of the Prophet وسلم, when it comes to following because we testify and bear witness that what? That Muhammad وسلم, he is the messenger of Allah. And then the Shaykh he goes on to get into the next chapter, but inshallah ta'ala, we will save that until our next session. Fa naktafi bihad al qadr wa sallallahu alayhi sallam ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa jazakum allahu khayra illa al liqa until next time we meet. Astaudi'akum allah wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.